Hello, everybody. Ian Barkin with you again for another episode of One Take Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Really exciting. Lots of people on the line already. If you are joining us and you have joined already, share your name, share your location. Uh, you know the drill. Submit questions as we go. It'll be great to have the interaction and interactivity. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just say hope everyone is well. The, uh, the state of the world persists and it's tough on many, I know. So hope uh, this finds you healthy and well and uh, with your loved ones. Uh, and thank you again for joining us on One Take Live. So without uh, further ado, for those who've seen the show before, we cover the future of work, life and culture. Uh, and we talk about a lot of things in that realm uh, as far as how enterprises operate and digital transformation, how we apply technology, how we help uh, enable and, uh, and supercharge great people and how we create great experiences. The one common denominator, the unifier, the unifying factor um, that's often referred to and touched on, but we haven't delved as great uh, detail or into this as, um, as much as I'd like to is data. And so I could not be more thrilled to have our next guest on the show. Welcome to the show, Keith McCormick to One Take Live. Hi, I'm really looking forward to this. Good. Um, so Keith, let's let's start with your your background. So I'll, I'll, I'll set you up and then you fill it in. But um, you're a data scientist. You're a teacher extraordinaire. You're an author. You're a lion tamer. You're yeah. um, Research is iffy this week. So I think all those things are accurate. Um, and you're a prolific LinkedIn learning author. So so walk us through it. What? Um, who are you? Who is this man? And uh, and how did you get your start? Where did you uh, where did you think you wanted to, to be and go with your education? And how did you come to, to where you are here now? Well, you know, I've had uh, I've had somewhat different roles over the years, but the common denominator has been building predictive models. And I've been doing that since the 90s. So depending on how you want to count, uh, if you want to start with the more traditional statistics models, you know, it's really been since the mid uh, mid 90s. So um, went to a engineering school, uh, studying computer science, got, but got really interested in psychology. So um, my undergraduate was a little bit more of a mix probably than uh, than most. In fact, nearly just kind of dodged a bullet. I nearly went the PhD route and I was contemplating psychometrics of all things at one uh, one point, you know, test and measures, you know, like personality intelligence test type stuff. Uh, but I uh, didn't go that route because I ended up doing uh, software training and my uh, started that in my late 20s. And that through a series of different things uh, led me to data science and doing more things like machine learning model, uh, models and consulting. Outstanding. So, okay, so we got to, you and I touched on this in, in the setup, but uh, I, I uh, too was fascinated by humans and, and psychology and uh, did a, a, a less impressive uh, combination of academic pursuits. I combined economics and psychology, mm -hmm. but um, I, I loved your backstory on uh, on how you how you structured and crafted what you what you ultimately called a multidisciplinary um, uh, degree and just the name that you gave it can you can you share that with us yeah it, it is kind of a fun story and I don't I don't get a chance to tell it very often so I was on um, a military scholarship uh, you know I don't know if uh, folks remember kind of what was going on in the late 80s there was uh, you know there was a real military buildup it's kind of Cold War type stuff, you know, that, that seems downright historical now, uh, but um, was able to, to get this military scholarship to help, uh, you know, pay for school. The, the reason that's relevant is because I was somewhat locked in, you know, the, the Army had very specific requirements about how many computer science courses I had to take and, and what schools were eligible for, you know, this program and so on. So when I went to my colonel at the time, and said, sir, you know, I kind of want to do this psychology thing. Could I even contemplate, you know, a double major or changing majors? <laughs> and he was like, Cadet, you're, you're really giving me a headache here. Uh, but, but we looked into it and there was a way, and that is that I could get a degree in interdisciplinary studies as long as I met the Army's requirement for a computer science degree. So that's how I got the mix. And then this is the part that I think you got a kick out of. I had to give it a name. You know, so I had to look at all the courses that I took over four or more years 
and said, what's the, what's the thread? What's the theme? So uh, right on my transcript, it actually says interdisciplinary studies and natural and artificial intelligence. Love it. I absolutely love that because, well, for a few reasons. One, because artificial intelligence, first, back in the 80s, that was pretty progressive. I mean, the name's been around for a long time, yeah. but pretty progressive to to, to characterize the, the technical component of what you were doing in your degree as that. Uh, but then, then to actually um, pay deference to humanity as having <laughs> natural intelligence was, was pretty cool as well. Um, and it'll come up again in our discussion because 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 we humans are, are um, relevant in, in a lot of ways and, and in this discussion. Um, Absolutely. So, okay. yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it was also kind of the, the the end of the AI winter. So, you know, I was an undergrad then. So yep. this whole AI winter, not AI winter, neural nets are hot, neural nets are out of fashion. That what didn't have any meaning for me at the level I was in my career. So what was hot when I was an undergrad in my undergraduate courses was expert systems. Neural nets were kind of out of fashion. So, right. so that's why the interplay of natural and artificial intelligence was so interesting to me. It was really this question of what computers are good at and what humans are good at and how they can work together because that was really what was on everybody's mind at that time. Yeah, outstanding. Um, take a quick break to welcome folks to the show. I uh, wanted to say hello to David from Salt Lake, Maria from Florida. Thank you, Maria, for joining us. Uh, Russ Katzman, also from Florida. Vince, um, Joyce, all the way from London. Amy Lesko from DC. Shay from Boston. Ahmed from Egypt. Uh, so great to see everybody. Thanks for joining us. If, uh, if you haven't shared your name, please do so. Um, so let's, before we get into the, the artificial intelligence and data science courses you've crafted and present to natural intelligence students, um, I would hope. Um, walk us through the types of work that you then did after your degree. How did you apply um, your, your focus on, on data, on statistics, on, uh, on AI as well to, um, to your early stages of your career? Well, you know, there's a, another kind of interesting detail to sneak in that was kind of on the psychology side. And that is that um, when I finished in 1991, it was the beginning of the drawdown, which again is this kind of little historical thing that most people wouldn't have rem remembered. But that meant that I wasn't sent to active duty and really nobody in my cohort was. So, and I'd kind of, it's not that I wanted to do the military as a career, but I was, I'd been thinking for a long time, I owed them these years, you know? So I was thinking, gosh, what do I want to do? Um, so I actually had um, an SAT prep, small SAT prep company for a little while, because again, I'd gotten really fascinated with all these, um, you know, tests and who does well and who does poorly and why. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I was doing that while I was getting ready for grad school. And I was doing a lot of research at the time. I was using uh, SPSS, which a lot of people probably know from their university days, it's been around for decades. Right. And um uh, was taking some advanced classes. They were, in fact, this is kind of a funny story that I often don't mention very often. SPSS was starting to add different scripting languages and so on. Not at the time, but a little bit later. That's what got me into Python. You would think what got me into Python, uh, you know, learning a little bit of Python was machine learning, but it was right. the behind the scenes scripting language of SPSS, not during this period, but a little later. Sure. So anyway, I got to know the SPSS training staff and they said, you know, we always have a tough time. We get some people that are too academic or not academic enough. We need someone that's a blend of the two. And I, I guess I was that. So I started teaching introductory SPSS software classes. And that got me a lot deeper into the statistics world. And I did that for a decade. I mean, I was traveling all over the world, mostly domestically, but taught thousands of people um, how to use SPSS. Interesting. So apologies for the dog in the background. Yes. This is the joys of doing this from home. Um, he's protecting us, by the way. My, my mini golden doodle is protecting the family. Um, so so SPSS is no small thing because, as you say, this is this was a, um, a statistical package and a statistical mathematical approach, but one that that derived from from psychology and from statistics, not from computer science. So I would imagine that's that's also sort of colored your approach and influenced your um, your take on how enterprises understand and apply data to themselves. 
Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. We got really deep into both theory and application in these courses. So this was like, you know, um, analysis of variance, uh, fancier stuff like MANOVA and MANCOVA, structural right. equation modeling, you know. <laughs> um, you know, looking back, at the time, I would have felt a little bit funny putting it this way. But looking back, it feels almost like... Um, a master's in stats, but via the school of hard knocks, you know, right. because, you know, we, we got really deep into it. So that's still, you know, it, it ends up being about 10 or 20% of my predictive analytics work now, but it's a really, really important 10 or 20%. And I think what's probably happening to, you know, a younger generation of data scientists is that they take an R course somewhat in lieu of these theory courses. Right. You, know, you only have so much time in the day. You can only take so many courses. So instead of taking an introductory uh, stats 101, you take an R course. And they're really not the same. You really need both. And I wonder how many younger data scientists are getting both, you know, are getting the conceptual and the coding. Absolutely. Well, and, and as you say, and I think the probably the thing that best serves enterprises today is, is a hybrid, a hybridized model on, on multiple levels, but that's sort of that hybridized approach to, to not taking things completely from a technical standpoint or a business standpoint or a human versus a computer standpoint. And, and that's a rare combination. Uh, and one that, as you said, is, is, is crafted in a school of hard knocks, crafted in the, in the, in the trenches, if you will, on, on the, at the coal face, we'll see how many analogies I have. Yeah, um, where you actually have to apply it and see how it relates. Uh, so let's pivot for a moment, because because one of the reasons that we came to know one another is because of our our work on LinkedIn Learning. Hmm. And, and, I, and I've done a little bit, and you have done a lot bit. You have thirteen courses on LinkedIn Learning, which in and of itself is just awe inspiring. And then the topics are are complex. They them they are also awe inspiring. Um, things like machine learning and AI foundations, how people can use decision trees or, or advanced decision trees or um, elements of predictive analytics and data mining. So what was sort of what was that trajectory? Was there an arc that you put together in your your course curriculum to to train? And and I suppose second part of the question, question part two, is who's it for? Who are you trying to to upskill to be comfortable with all of these complex uh, concepts? I, I love the who's it, who is it for? Because I, I'm super focused on that, as I'm sure you are when you're putting the, the courses together. So um, first, let me briefly just say how much I love that library and that platform. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I, I love about it is how carefully curated it is. Because, you know, as both... Uh, we would both know as we're trying to figure out what, how can we contribute to this library? You have to really be thinking about wh what's missing, you know, what's the missing piece that the library needs. And that's so different than a lot of other platforms that are really kind of a marketplace of ideas. So what's, what's powerful about the curation and what really led to me being part of it is there was a feeling at the time when I first, uh, started chatting with those folks in 2016 and, and my first course came out in 2017 that there needed to be some hands-on point and click foundational courses and just you know core famous techniques like decision trees so that was my first couple of courses was that kind of stuff but what's wonderful as you know an author on the platform is you get to know the other authors and you get to know what's out there in the library and I spend, gosh, I must spend a couple of hours every week without fail watching other author, authors' stuff because it's really fabulous. But it also helps me really understand what's out there, know what the playlists are covering well. And next thing you know, I was proposing that um, I do things like the non-technical skills of data scientists and things for the executives that manage the analytics team and their bosses too, because this is what I felt in some cases was a gap in the library and where I felt I could contribute. So it's really shifted from point and click to more thought leadership. But, you know, I did a, I did a really great uh, point and click course that I'm quite proud of in the last year, but it's for the most part shifted more towards the, um, 
the culture of analytics, I guess you could say. So, right. so therefore, who it's for has changed too, from mostly the practitioner five years ago uh, to mostly their colleagues and their bosses now. Right. Well, or also courses that a data scientist can take if they feel ill understood within their organizations. I love that topic okay. because I think so many data scientists fall into that category. Right. So, okay. So love that. Lots of places we can go um, and, and in no in, in no way to, to promote the work I did, but the very first course I wanted to do, the working title in my head was an MBA and RPA because because I wow. wanted to address that, The as you said, the executives and the decision makers who then have teams, but they have um, a gap in their knowledge set that helped them to then apply technology. And I would imagine in spades, same sort of imperative that enterprises need to understand the power of the data that they have, but need to understand just the roles on their team and what these people are trying to do. What does it mean to build a good model? How do you apply them? How, frankly, even how should you be, how should you be sort of targeting the teams and then funding them and enabling them to go and do their work? Um, so I love that. So let's let's back up for a moment because because you said that they're they're sometimes misunderstood. There's a there's in my career there's been this heavy sort of um, sort of oil and water theme that comes up. Usually it's IT and business are my oil and water that I that I spend time in or spend time trying to to combine stir fast enough that it looks like they're working together. Um, and and in the last few years, technology and automation was was really the, the the stirring stick, I suppose, that brought them together. But they still seem to to distance themselves. Where does your realm sit? Is 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 business IT the same sort of oil water characters on stage, or are there different factions of the business? And and where should it live? Well, it's such, it's such a tough topic because I, I think it's fair to say that most organizations haven't sorted out um, how to do this, do this well. So there's a lot of experimentation out there. And it's not that machine learning is new. It's just data science teams are new, you know, and, and, it, and it's how to get it to work at an organizational level. So the most common is probably to have the data science scientists and the predictive folks going up through IT. But when I say that's the most common, it's probably only true about 35% of the time. So the rest of the organizations are all over the place. And sometimes analytics ends up belonging to one particular line of business, usually because the head of that line of business was the one that had the money or that okay. was the bravest or right. that had the most initiative. So it starts out as marketing analytics. And the next thing you know, the other lines of business are trying to borrow that analytics team for their own stuff. Um, so, you know, who should analytics report to? Gosh, that's really tough. But, you know, the predictive modeler in me generally thinks that having a chief analytics officer is a pretty cool thing, but that's probably five or 10% of organizations. Interesting. Well, so, okay, so you've got you've got two scenarios that it seems that you suggest are, are more common. There's either the, it's champion oriented. It's just the yeah. person who really got behind it and you no know, budget's one thing, but just the proclivity, just the drive, the the um, the, the guts to, to go put it together. Uh, and then the other is kind of path of least resistance where it feels complex and technical perhaps to some extent, or maybe the data comes from the systems. So we'll just stick it with IT because they're closest to the, to, the, to the root of the data. But does it better serve an organization to be elsewhere? Are you suggesting it should have a seat at the executive, uh, I guess, cabinet and, and executive table to, to then influence every decision made within a business? Well, I mean, I, of course, I think that analytics is tremendously important and, and done well should pay for itself. So, yes, I think that analytics should have a seat right. at the table at the at the sea level in some form. You know, could it be through um, I've seen some scenarios where, you know, it's a role like the chief strategy officer, I think, would be very interesting. But, but let me briefly comment on. Um, some of the challenges that sometimes comes up, it, it, it seems a natural fit 
within IT, but in my experience, what happens is it becomes a little bit too technology focused right. because you know it's a, let's talk to the vendors, let's buy some technology, and then let's hire some data scientists. And, uh -huh. and who wants to be on a team where they don't get to influence their own mission statement? You know, so I, I'm always about get the humans and then get the technology. Don't get the technology and then the humans. That's that's my two cents on that. Right. So, and and completely agree. I'm um, having. In, in my line of work, seeing people be fascinated by shiny things that are easier to wrap your head and your procurement team around. So you procure said shiny things and then you figure out how to apply them and perhaps they weren't the right shiny thing for the task at hand. And so you end up having, I've seen scenarios where people bought a particular software tool just because the mechanics of the procurement process lent themselves to buying it faster. And that was the deciding factor, which which didn't spell success in the long run. Um, you mentioned something in in the nature of your earlier LinkedIn learning courses. You said that it was hands on point and click for the core. That point and click suggests perhaps tools, perhaps some standard models, but it also suggests that the the audience, the student, and then ultimately ultimately the practitioner doesn't need a PhD. In, in statistics and analytics and data science so that more people in a company can actually apply these models. We talked a little bit about this before the show. There's this sort of, in, in again, in the digital transformation space, there's this concept of more and more people being able to, to with low code, no code capabilities, digitize the processes they are most uh, familiar with. It sounds like there may be a comparison here to to what you're talking about. Oh, for sure. And you know, and this is one of those topics that just comes up every couple of years, it seems. Uh, you know, but but in in various forms. And I've seen quite a bit of buzz lately. It seems to be building about you know low code. But you know, let me let me briefly kind of advocate for using a tool with a graphical user interface. You know, I think I think in some ways. Um, Folks that have, uh, you know, learned uh, data science through coding, you know, things like R and Python, think, oh mm -hmm. gosh, you know, the the graphical user interface uh, based tools, they're kind of toys, you know, they're they're not they're not complex enough, you know, they're not a serious tool. I would, you know, disagree because the the same debate was going on in the '90s with with SPSS when I was starting out more on the statistics side. Folks that were doing statistics with coding then. Now this is pre R, so I won't get historically into what platforms were popular and stuff back then. But there was this debate then between coders and people using the graphical user interface. And for me, I felt the advantage of the graphical user interface isn't that it did all the work for you, but it got the repetitive tasks out of the way and presented you with your options where you could see them, which I think is super important. Because you know, as you know, when you're coding, sometimes you could generate something like a regression model with a couple of lines of code. The code itself is not the hard part. The hard part is, is my model any good? It's mm -hmm. the interpretation and the going back. So I think I think the theory remains just as strong. So the fear, and this again comes back year, every few years it comes back as a debate. I don't think the real skill set is about creating the model. It's about the evaluation and interpretation an application of the model to solving business problems. And I don't think that goes away. Right. Well, so in that's, and thank you, that, that's a, a great distinction. And there's also, in whatever walk of life you are in business, there's always this distinction between having data and then ultimately at the end of the that chain somewhere having insight and, and the analytics that provides the insight that then creates something actionable that suggests you know, we should design a product differently or structure a call center script differently or just something that influences the the consumer or customer experience, which is ultimately the goal in a lot of cases for a business to, to stay in business and to thrive um, at business. So I want to come back to the who for a moment, for who the student is, who the optimal uh, the folks that we we are both are trying to to enable um, and upskill, and it gets real. It, it becomes very um, sort of uh, democracy oriented. We're, we're trying to the GUI interfaces might democratize this capability a little bit easier, as you say. It's it's not necessarily the model; it's what you do with it. Um, 
you go from democracy to the citizens within the democracy. Um, you and I are both hearing the word citizen used more often. And in, in, in my realm, it's citizen developers, yeah. um, which I think is, is, is a strong word to be developing and not necessarily something you want all citizens doing. Uh, and you'd mentioned um, before we got started too, this idea of effectively a data citizen. Hmm. Does that have legs? Well, I just uh, I just heard that phrase, um, data citizen, quite recently. Um, it's something that uh, my friends and, and colleagues at a uh, in an organization called IADS, I A D double S. It's a nonprofit that's trying to figure out, you know, what the heck data science is to help employees and employers connect, um, and also to help university programs. So let me make a brief appeal to the, to the vendors out there and see if somebody can solve this problem. What I would what I would love to see is a way that the tools that expert data scientists use and the experts that a broader cut of the organization might use to explore data. Where I get nervous is where you have these exploratory tools and you hit a button and it like makes a prediction, you know? Because I just don't understand why you want everybody in the organization making their own predictive model. Predictive models should be, you know, the, one of the answers to where to house analytics that we didn't mention, but is another popular option is kind of the center of excellence type model, you know, but I think predictions really have to be agreed upon, have some expert, you know, working on them, but then the predictions sent out to the rest of the business where they can be used. So I want a lot of folks exploring data and working with data, but I want a relatively modest number making predictions on which we're going to automatically drive um, you know uh, actions you know in the classic machine learning and AI way so what I would love to have is some kind of a family of tools where somebody can discover something interesting in the data and then alert one of the predictive modelers and the predictive modeler can say wow that's really interesting let me see what the data is telling me you know at a, at a deeper level but you know, even though we're supposedly democratizing this stuff, I think we're actually creating a wall between those two worlds because you have the expert data scientists working in a tool like Python, which the data citizens for sure are not, right. but they're working in some other tool that the expert data scientists probably don't really know that much about. Uh, so we're supposed to be increasing communication. And I think there's a risk that we're decreasing it. That's fascinating. I, I, I find that incredibly interesting because you've got Either you've got a structured sort of military hierarchy that the roles are, are are coordinated well and communicated, or you've got a class system where there's segregation and people aren't interacting with each other. And in some cases, I would imagine um, struggling with or looking down on people who are trying to play data scientists and really just confusing things. Um, and and I, I imagine that's probably more prone to happen naturally in a business. Uh, the center of excellence is an interesting point too, just because while I've seen centers of excellence used as well, the, the, in, the, the inherent um, nature of a center of excellence that succeeds is that it needs to represent various different groups within a business. It has to be sort of multidisciplinary. <clears throat> you can't just centralize it somewhere and leave it to be autonomous and doing its own thing. So there's, there's a lot of that same idea of we need to involve a lot of people in an enterprise. Um, let's let's back right up to the the ones and zeros for a moment, though, and the data at the heart of this entire discussion. Are enterprises now um, able to tap into a greater wealth of data than they were prior to software eating the world, or or is it about the same amount as 10, 20, 30 years ago? As you said, the the concepts are not new, uh, but is the substrate richer in which to apply the concept? Well, I mean, there's no question that more data is in digital form, you know, so uh, there's no question of that. However, um, where you where you get into trouble is that when you actually go to build the model, I, I'm on projects more often where too little data is the problem than on projects where you have an overwhelming amount. And, and let me talk about this. Uh, two different ways. One is the, the height of the data set, the number of rows you have. That, that's where I find that people get into trouble. And the reason is a lot of times that what you're trying to predict 
has a common category and a rare category. The classic example is fraud, you know? So, you know, one hopes you don't have millions of fraudulent credit card transactions unless you have an enormous database of these, you know, hopefully the fraudulent transactions are a small fraction. Right. So if you build a data set that's about 50-50 frauds and not frauds, all of a sudden you don't have as much data as you think, right? So that that's something that a lot of folks don't think about if they're not a modeler, but, uh, you know, we usually don't have too much Everybody worries about that because they look at the size of the data warehouse. But when you actually think about how models are built, you you have too little more often than you have too much. But the other issue, though, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it's kind of related to uh, this uh, human in the loop uh, work that I've been I've been uh, doing uh, lately is that we still have a lot of unstructured data out there. Now, it might be in digital form, but it might be a paragraph of text or it might have issues in some other way, or images. Think about images. I mean, images are always digital, right? I mean, gosh, I can't imagine that there's any companies out there that have a stack of Polaroids in their you right. know, data. So it's all <laughs> digital, but just because it's digital doesn't mean that you can't use, that you can use it. That's useful, you, right? you probably cannot use it in its initial form. It's, uh, you know, it's not just about the pixels. You've got to there's data annotation and all kinds of other stuff that comes involved. So yes, the, the amount of stuff that's in digital form, absolutely. I mean, there's just without a doubt, that's absolutely exploded and, that, and that's never gonna go back to what it was. We, we're, we're never really gonna have analog, even, even in healthcare where, you know, physician's notes persist a little bit, you know, um, that, that's all over time going away. But that doesn't mean it's useful in its native form. Interesting. Well, in, in technologies are getting better at not just ultimately um, understanding the the parameters of this thing like a picture. It's they're getting better at interpreting, but there's still there's always wiggle room in interpretation. So it's I imagine while you've got a glut of data, it's you have to build models to determine whether the the interpretation is useful and directionally accurate to then build models on. Um, it, it, it is interesting to think that we've, we've spent so much time talking about big data and yet, as you point out, if you're trying to solve discrete problems, it's just not quite as big as, as you'd think. Um, I've in, in enterprise operations, that's been my experience as well as you just don't have a, a flood of information about how you, how you onboard employees. You only have so many employees. And so, um, so you got to choose your choose your targets carefully as far as where you want to solve the solve big problems with with data models. Um, let's let's transition uh, for the last few minutes we have together to a, a new exciting role that you have that I think is is awesome on multiple levels mm -hmm. that we'll explore as you introduce it. So so you're also now a chief data science ad advisor to a company called Cloud Factory. Well, it's. Um... It's interesting to spend just a moment talking about how we know each other, um, you know, because not every LinkedIn author happens to, uh, you know, have had one on one, you know, chats with each other. There's, you know, there's quite a few of us, but I admired your RPA course. And I, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, while we're kind of doing the segue that in many ways, you know, you have more of a focus on RPA and me having more of a focus on machine learning. How much of that is the same? Because, you know, data prep and deployment and getting all these people to work together because RPA is really the, very much the same, except without that predictive piece. Almost right. everything else about it is incredibly similar. So that's how we first connected. But then what's remarkable is, is that as my content generation and as my career focus moved more and more towards thought leadership that I stumbled upon and, you know, the LinkedIn the LinkedIn algorithm gets the credit, Ian, uh, truly, because I had not heard of Cloud Factory. And I said, wow, downtown Durham, 20 minutes from me. What a cool company with a cool mission. And what a really cool founder, you know, for a fact, uh, you know, how cool the origin story I, I, is. I can vouch for all of that. Th then we discover that we had Cloud Factory in common in a way because the, 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 the founder of Cloud Factory, Mark Sears, and you became friends when you really by coincidence were near each other you know at a, at a conference and uh that led me to uh discover the interview that you did with mark which i really enjoyed um in fact on this very platform right the one take platform and uh, it was the warm-up act I, I was working out the kinks and now now you and i are talking yeah 
<laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, just so, so, so many coincidences and synergies. It was really fascinating. Right. And because I think that very few people understand how similar it is taking a machine learning model into production and taking RPA and put into production that I said, wow, you know, you really need to be one of my first guests on a LinkedIn live that I'll be doing for cloud factory once a month. So I think next month, right? March of, 2021, we're going to be having that um, conversation. And I'm looking forward to I think it'll be great. That's really my role with, uh, at Cloud Factory. So, you know, I, I've got all these irons in the fire and some stuff that I really, really enjoy, like the LinkedIn learning and, the, you know, the courses that I teach for UC Irvine. So we had to work out a way that it was, you know, uh, not a full-time role. But I'm so excited about this role because I love the mission of Cloud Factory, you know, for folks that don't know, there's a couple hundred of us and in, in what internally we call, you know, the, the, the core team, but we have thousands and thousands of these uh, workers that do things like data annotation um, and data processing for Cloud Factory's clients and the kind of transformation that Cloud Factory brings to these folks' lives and their communities was so inspiring. So because I'm busy with speaking and consulting and so on, I, I didn't think that a position like this was in the cards for me, but when I found out how cool Cloud Factory was, I just had to have a conversation with them. Uh, and lo and behold, there was a way that um, I could play this thought leadership role there, and I've really enjoyed it. In fact, it, you know, it's a combination of these live events that I'm going to do once a month and also some kind of longer format articles that I'm writing with them. And I'm really enjoying that too, because um, I think one actually comes out today or, 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 uh, or very, uh, very soon, because I've really enjoyed working on those as well, tying all these together. I mean, kind of having this kind of conversation that we've had today, right. you know, but in prose, helping people plan a strategy, um, including when to know, when the human is going to do a better job than the machine exactly. and how to go to market sooner because you know how to use those resources strategically. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I think I, from one of your courses, and I think it was one of the, the more recent, the, the non-technical skills of effective data scientists, which I think is an outstanding title and, uh, and more directed towards how can, how can data geeks, um, be empathetic to the sort of the, the way to communicate with a larger organization. Um, but you speak to data science and what it is, and it's effectively, you say, addressing the challenges of an organization with data. And that's what I love about your work. I love about this discussion and I love about the, the um, where you're going because, because there truly is a hybrid and there's a, there's an ever changing um, dovetail an equation between artificial and natural intelligence yeah. to, to understand, interpret data, to, to in some cases digitize it, to clean it most certainly, uh, and then to turn it into something more than just the ones and zeros for the purposes of making thoughtful, informed decisions. And technology has helped in some ways um, it's hurt in others. It's uh, it's made people believe that they can oversimplify things. As you said, you don't just get to hit a button and send the scripts running and and magically solve uh, things. You need to be more astute and attuned to what you're trying to achieve. But that's what I love about Cloud Factory and the the, the story that that took shape years ago when I first met Mark. Uh, Mark Sear is the founder. Is is it really is this beautiful hybrid of using people and technology that's ever evolving, thanks to his focus on on technology, but also on creating meaningful, impactful work for people. Uh, and that's another thing I always found fascinating about about the industry that I'm, I'm in uh, in outsourcing, which is really we create jobs, right? and and the the nature and the skill level and and the need for humans in those jobs will always evolve and should always evolve. And, and people need to be taking courses like yours to keep their skill set relevant because jobs will change. That's the only constant is change, um, someone said once. Uh, but but I, that's why I think it's so cool that you're working with Mark and with Cloud Factory because I think that's going to be an amazing partnership with some really, really valuable, relevant, pertinent content uh, that the world needs to hear now. 
Well, and it's and it's all it's all related, right? So, yeah. I, so I think the non-technical skill that you were referring to, you know, was the section I did on cognitive empathy. And uh, one of my favorite examples, in fact, perhaps the one that I use in the course is uh, lost bags. You can look at things like when did I check in? When was the time of the flight? Was there a connection? You can build a model just based on that structured data. But if you want a really good model, somewhere in there, there was a customer service interaction the day before the flight. Am I, you know, something like, am I allowed to bring this with me or whatever, right? And if you bring that data in, then you're going to do better. And anyone who has a smart device can tell you that smart devices still can't handle subtle. They still can't handle sarcasm and things like that. So sometimes you just need a human to look at that paragraph and grab the fact out of there or or the equivalent of that. There's so many things or, you know, uh, uh, annotating a 2D images or what, what have you. But there are still things that humans just do so much faster and so much more effectively than the machines. And you're selling the model short if you don't widen the data set with those right. additional sources of information. Right. As, as somebody who speaks fluent sarcasm, I completely get um, the, the, the situation you just laid out. Uh, and we could go on forever because I think this is also a really interesting segue into design thinking and service design and opening an aperture and holistically studying um, just human behavior because you're right, because it doesn't, because the things we do don't necessarily fit models cleanly sometimes. And that's what demands models to be more nuanced and complex because because we are nuanced and complex. Uh, but as much as I'd love to keep going on, uh, I wanna wrap it here and, and maybe we, we we are gonna talk again uh, on your show very soon and, and would love to get you back on this show um, as soon as, as you're able. So Keith, thank you so much for, for, for sharing your insights, for your great coursework. We'll put links to it in, uh, in the show notes under here somewhere eventually right. when we put this on, uh, online. We'll also uh, put links to, to your blogs and the work that you're doing now with Cloud Factory. And, and with that, any, any last words to, uh, to the world's data citizens and aspiring data citizens? Well, I would say that you know, any, anyone that's enjoyed this conversation is absolutely going to enjoy our conversation um, the end of March. So whether it's following me or following Cloud Factory, one way or another, I, I hope that if they've enjoyed today's conversation, that they catch us in a few weeks. Perfect. Thanks again, Keith. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you.